welcome to another episode of the Being Human and Doing Psychotherapy po podcast, where I'm curious about parsing out uh, what's the human story behind the role of the psychotherapist and what is the uh, psychotherapeutic part that we have in all of us. Uh, and today I'm uh, joined by Priscilla Short, and it's my great honor because I've um, been on one of your workshops uh, and I was quite impacted by how you presented transgenerational trauma, but also just by the by uh, involving your own humanity in it. Uh, so that was the reason uh, I approached you and um, where my curiosity was lying. So welcome. And uh, we can start with the first question, which is what are some words that you associate yourself with? Yeah, so I had so many words that I wrote. <laughs> and um and and so I somebody once described me as um protean and um I didn't know what that meant. And I've used it a lot since. And the word protean means you're lots of different things. Mm. And I know I'm lots of different things. I'm lots of different things, and that fits with how I think we all are. I'm lots of different things. So the temptation when I was asking that question was to tell you all the nice things. That I... <laughs> um, but I think inherently my kind of core kind of parts, words that I think I relate to, I'm just, I'm very curious. Mm. Um, I'm very relational. I'm not always brilliant at being relational but I am very relational so if I'm not good at being relational I'll, I will usually try and repair quite quickly um I'm I was trying to think of a word uh I'm qu I'm quite energized like I have quite a lot of energy like I kind of come at the world I can sit forward in my chair and I'm I'm like that so I'm yeah. quite a lot of kind of energy and um I guess you could call it drive but I'm, I'm quite energized and I'm also incredibly grateful to be very content. So mm. those would probably be the words that I uh, that I think. But there are obviously lots of other words that other people might use to describe mm. me, which are not so um, which are not so positive. But yeah, which one would you choose? Which one you know when you are in conflict with yourself? What mm. what what's the weapon you take out most often? <laughs> Well, I think the I think if you all had asked me that question twenty years ago, the word would be really different than the one that I am now. Mm -hmm. I think training as a psychotherapist has changed me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the word I would I think the one that floats to the top and is the biggest part of my experience is 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 curiosity. I I I am I am very curious. I always have been very curious, but I don't think I would have ever seen that as something that I would have named before. I think becoming a psychotherapist has helped me understand that is what I am. Um, you know, as a child, I was told that I was, you know, nosy and annoying and, you know, asked too many questions. And I, so it was kind of slightly presented as a like, slightly more negative thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that the core thing is I am really curious. And I think that um, that can lead into kind of things that are helpful and sometimes not always so helpful the way I can be curious is not always so helpful but yeah I would say curious is the thing that I think I am most now and would like to hold on to most mm. that's interesting uh, I can relate to two things I can relate to the curiosity and to this yeah. and, to, uh, and to yeah and and yeah. to to the to being curious but not knowing how to uh, do it relationally <laughs> um yeah, that's it. Yeah, because I think you can be curious from a self-directed way. I want to know. Yes. Rather than help me understand. And I think that, that shift is to be curious. If you're thinking about the psychotherapeutic curiosity, my curiosity is for your benefit, not for mine. The, the worldly kind of idea of curiosity is my curiosity is for my benefit, not for yours, I think. And I mm. think that that shift has been part, I guess, of um, being more sensitive of the relational dynamic. You asked me a lovely question before we logged on of if there are any questions that I ask you that you don't want to ask. That's a very relational curiosity. 
you know, I don't have, you know, you don't, you don't have to. So it's curiosity, but it's not an imposition. Mm, mm. And and as as you were saying, that's interesting because as you mentioned your words, I was sitting with how many of those took words uh, work to get to, and you named that interestingly just after I had that thought. But um, I'm wondering if you can share a bit with us what that work entailed to sit with your own content, to to not judge your own curiosity, to um to be able to be relational um it's it's easy when you go through the training but as we start Mm -hmm. there are a lot of things to go through well I'm embarrassed to say that it took me quite a long time actually to make the make the shift when I my first career I had a first career as a market researcher as a qualitative researcher and I was good at it and I ran my own business. And that the kind of curiosity that you need to be a good qualitative researcher is one where I ask the questions for my benefit. Mm. Yeah, I'm gathering data, I'm gathering information. So I'm asking questions of you, not for your benefit, mm. but for mine, so that I can then take that information and go and do something with it. And It wasn't until my third bit of training when I was doing my doctoral training and we had a brilliant, uh, we had a brilliant, uh, she was a professor at the department actually, who who taught the person-centred module, which I didn't do my core training person-centred, but I think we've probably all done something that is person-centred. And I had my light bulb moment, which was very transforming, which was when she said, but Priscilla, you're not asking questions for your benefit. You don't even need to know. The client needs to know. And I thought, really? Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And that was my real shift was, oh, I'm asking questions for the client. Now, that sounds really, really obvious, probably, to most psychotherapists. But when you've had 25 years training as a qualitative researcher to ask questions for my benefit, it was it was a it was game changing. And it shifted me from being. Uh, a mediocre to good psychotherapist to being what I would like to think now of much more of a good to excellent psychotherapist because I've kind of got it and it, it really it I remember going around the room kind of going like that was incredible and everybody else was going mm. oh, that was obvious <laughs> and I'm going, oh, it's, uh. yeah. so my story was that I'd ask questions for for different reasons mm. and I and it was such a change such a change yeah so uh, I don't know how they call it in England but in Serbia we have it, it's called uh, it's almost like profession I don't know have the words but um, you know when people call f- occupational therapy and so how like what whatever you do can actually like harm your arms or and it's it's similar with the brain the patterns that we pick up from mm-hmm. the way that that particular job is being done Mm -hmm. can actually be quite harming if that's the only thing we do so Mm -hmm. I'm sitting with like me being a scientist and how much for example am I I'm trained to see what's missing (laughs) and uh, when I give feedback even in my training sometimes I sit with like I can only see what's not what wasn't there and I'm failing even for myself to see what what all is there already the abundance of what is there yes yes yeah. so it's very interesting how what we do shapes us in in such a profound way that we don't often realize and and i'm wondering what other things you may have noticed that have kind of been like profoundly shaping you in that way hmm. well i think i mean just a, a thought that just popped into my head when you were saying that is I think the thing is that if you if you're not aware of what I, I if you'd have asked me I wasn't aware of why I was really asking questions and that I was asking questions in that one dimensional way so really up until that point and all the way through my kind of core psychotherapy training it's no point in my role plays and all those awful cringy things that we have to do as therapists at no point did somebody say why do you think you're they, they kind of do process reports why are you asking that question but not like 
who are you asking that question for? Mm. And and I think I think that that for me, so it was that process of was really really key was the thing of being coming aware, of becoming aware. Who am I doing this for? Mm. And my first career was completely about doing it for me, earning money, building my business, being successful, blah blah blah. Of course, I had customer service. I was doing it for them, but mm-hmm. I was doing it. For them. So I think that was a really big change. I think the other, the only other really profound thing where I've had that change, I think, is is in relation to love. Mm. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think one of the things. I think I had a very, uh, again, one dimensional view of love growing up as a little girl in a patriarchal world of what love was and felt like and looked like. And um, and the me that I am now wants to scoop that little girl up and go, that's not going to go very well for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not, you know, just it's. That's a. It was a fairy tale version of love that didn't serve me very well. So I think the other thing where I've had a big transformation in my understanding of something is in relation to what love is. Mm. Do you want to say more? What is what love is for you now? Not or whatever you want to share. Maybe partly what was then and what was the illusion that was broken in some way. I think. Uh, I think at a very simple level. I grew up believing that love was a person, like you fell in love with someone oh. and you just had to find that someone, you know, the fairy story that ends when, you know, you find Prince Charles, you know, love is finding that person, not what you do with them once you found them. Yeah. And so I think what I'm much more aware of now is that love I mean, this is so obvious, but, you know, I think as a little girl, it wasn't obvious. Love is not a given if you find the person. Mm. It's not a given. You can find that person, your person, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't mean there's going to be love as a direct result of that. Mm. And I think my awareness now is much more that love is a combination of factors, is a combination of choice commitment investment time energy discipline to be loving it's a verb mm. you know it's to be loving and so i think that that uh and i'm very grateful for how i learned that i wasn't grateful at the time but i'm very grateful for how i've learned that yeah, yeah. <laughs> i can relate to that <laughs> But uh, I'm I'm curious because what you described growing up in a patriarchal society, also love was somehow for others as well. And I'm wondering how you've managed to also create it a verb for yourself and, mm-hmm. and have that discipline and commitment to stay with yourself and your states and um, everything that you are bringing and, and stay, not abandon yourself Mm. when it's the when the, when it's hardest basically mm. I think I'm really I'm really lucky so I had enough good love around me mm. um that I have a felt sense of being lovable however I think through my kind of teenage years and maybe my 20s possibly even into my 30s I'm 60 now, but in, you know, I I I really remember feeling somehow less deserving, less lovable, less um, being quite harsh on myself, and feeling that somehow um, I was kind of slightly less than in that. And I can definitely, I can remember moments of sitting often at times like Christmas or New Year or, you know, a birthday, and you'd have that real felt sense of not having a someone or not having a, and really thinking what's wrong with me. Mm. And it took me a really 
a long time to realize that how I responded to that thought would determine how I would feel afterwards. I couldn't control the thought, what's wrong with me? That's I'm not, it's not my control. I can still have that thought. But how I respond to that thought, do I respond lovingly towards myself? Do I treat myself the way I would treat my friend or anybody? Or do I kind of go, well, you're because you're an idiot and nobody loves you and you're ugly and you're fat and you're the, you know, do I go into that kind of self-critical place or do I go, okay, you know, just just compassion. So I think what I've done over the last 25 years is learn to treat myself with love even when I'm struggling. And that is a choice. It doesn't feel like something I want to do. And sometimes every fiber in my being is going, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, but look at that. But actually I go, yeah, but I still choose to treat myself with love. That's my birthright. It's all of our birthright. I choose to treat myself with kindness and with love. And that has, I think, at a very epigenetic level, I think it's changed me. Mm. Oh, I, I'm sitting with uh, just a, a sense of a felt sense of calm as you're speaking these words of like, ah, oh, it's possible almost. <laughs> I think it is possible. I really, I think it is. But I think the thing that's very hard, I remember there's um, there's a, an American psychologist and I, I always forget people's names. So the name will come in about 20 minutes. But I remember watching him speaking. He's one of these big microphones stride up and down the stage kind of, you know, guys. And um, Tony Robbins. And mm -hmm. I remember him, uh, I remember him, I remember watching a documentary about him. And he said, he said, change happens in a moment. And I'm thinking, gosh, that's not my experience of all, you know. And it, but it's, I think it's true. It's that moment that if you can get there, it's so hard to get there where you go, enough. I am going to stop treating myself as if I'm a piece of shit. Sorry, probably shouldn't. Yes. Say <laughs> no. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to change. Like I'm going to make that. Just doesn't mean I'm always going to be good at it. I'm always going to get it right. And I think what it, that's really guided my practice is the bit of going from felt sense, I feel unlovable into, but I could choose to treat myself with love, even though I don't feel it. <gasps> but I don't just it, you know, it, that thing, but actually going, whether I feel I don't deserve it, whether I, whatever, I'm going to choose. It's a, cho it's a choice. choice. I see what happened. And I think that's a very difficult thing for us humans. We can kind of go that way, left and right brain or head felt sense, whichever way you want to go. But, and I think it often feels like it's both ways. It's, it's really hard. Mm. To, to, when my children were little, somebody very wise said to me, and it really helped my parenting, you need to love your kids even more when, in your view, they deserve it the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. If we say love is based on whether you deserve it, we're getting it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I'm sitting with how interesting that this um, started with love and how how it became somehow the topic of the podcast mm -hmm. <laughs> and interestingly I always say this but the people come into the field of into my field exactly when I need to hear a message uh so it's yeah I'm sitting with the one like the beauty of the message you've just you're just somehow delivering um so I'm wondering can I pause for a moment because yeah. the therapist in me yeah that's important wants you to take that in yeah mm. because mm. sometimes we can hear something but actually letting it really drop because mm. it's a big message isn't it we need love most when we deserve it the least or we need love most when we feel like we deserve it the least or we need to love most when it seems like that person deserves it the least that is such a mm. radical different way of thinking about it yeah and it, it is interesting how often we slide through important messages and 
in in the in the haste of trying to get somewhere mm. and and it's just the simplicity of staying with even with this message mm. um and i'm noticing i was smiling but i'm not because that for me means that things are settling down i'm not reacting i'm really responding mm. um to what's happening um yeah and I can see it, I can hear it in my voice like now in the changes and. Mm. Mm. And I think that that's something I've really learned as a therapist is mm. that thing of moving from being pacey and trying to do as much as you can in a session and being up here into slowing it down. And I think that lots of us and myself included at times, we just go way too fast. We don't, we don't let stuff drop. Mm. in and take root mm. it's, it's an interesting I've recently come out from a um, uh, from a course and we were talking about separate to integrate and I was thinking about um, I was thinking about uh, so thinking without experience is neurosis <laughs> but experiencing without thinking lacks integration and so it's is that fine balance between um going for the experience but retrieving back enough so that things settle mm. and then we can make the next steps because otherwise we are really not allowing things to impact us in no. in any way um i think that's and i think um you know our most uh integrated state is when we're in both able to connect both our right and left hemispheres of our brains at the same time you know that lovely kind of corpus callosum bit between and that's the ability to think about what we're feeling and feel about what we're thinking and I actually haven't ever found the piece of research but I trust so much they go blind trust the person who told me um, that I'm fairly sure that it true and it resonates anyway experientially which is that it takes about 20 seconds for positive information to come in and land it takes about 0.4 of a second for negative information to come in and land so with positive information we have to give 40 times longer for that to come in so you think about the change process mm. a negative thing we can feel it instantly it's like yeah. they don't like me i love you uh, I just sit with that i love let that like it has we have to give it much 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 more space and if you're thinking about i guess the process of change if we rush through the positive there's a question you do about compliments uh there's if we rush through the positive it it we hear it but we don't receive it yeah that yeah yeah and interesting some people even respond to me saying i don't want to be defined by other people so i don't like compliments but then there is that part of not even being able to receive something um mm. Mm. so i'm wondering in your process of of allowing yourself to see those parts of you which um are beautiful uh, what were the resistances? What was stopping you? Um, and that may be related to the question we discussed before starting, which is what's what's one truth that you might have resisted about yourself that was really difficult to see? That I'm good enough. Mm. I don't have to earn it or work for it. Mm. I think I think that. Um, Again, it comes back to a kind of uh, patriarchal. I had a very patriarchal upbringing, very loving parents in their way, but very patriarchal. Uh, boys were very privileged over girls. And and so there was a sort of implicit sense in my childhood that my brother just is, but I need to. Mm. Yeah, leave him alone, leave him alone. But Priscilla, could you go, Anne? Leave him alone. Priscilla, could you go, Anne? So there was something about this kind of idea of 
I do think it was quite gendered. I don't think it was specific to me. I think it was kind of a generational gendered thing that mm -hmm. I get love by being a nice person who does stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas my the males in my family get love because they're male, <laughs> they're masculine. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of their birthright. So I think that, you know, it wasn't explicit. And if my mother was hearing this now, I'm fairly sure she'd have a sort of whoosh of, oh, I don't know if we did do that. But I think it was much more subtle than that. It wasn't, it's just in that subtle language that's used differently. It wasn't overt and it wasn't intentionally, uh, but it was, it, it was implicitly somehow saying you earn your love as a girl. Yeah. I dot 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 whatever it is looking beautiful doing good nice things being kind to people being you, you earn it mm, mm. yeah that is I I'm sitting with how I had to go through through those things and also like implicitly believing that even when you finally earn it it doesn't really um it's almost like it's not yours <laughs> And, and somehow it's like a lose-lose situation somehow you get to. Um, and, and also for me, what I was always sitting with is that kind of thing is like, yes, you can do all of these things. Um, and um, there are still things that are forbidden somehow. Uh, and so somehow there's a lot in that um, implicit patriarchal belief system, I would say. Uh, which, as you said, I think it's a really important thing to point out. It's not an intentional thing that generations have done, but somehow stays with us mm -hmm. in forms of beliefs. And I'm I'm wondering, uh, you've mentioned generationals and, and, and we discussed, we will touch a little bit on transgenerational trauma. And so I'm wondering, how did you and like, how did you encounter that topic in your own um, development and why you became interested eventually in, in that? Um, I think um, I became interested in it because I can see that all my beliefs really, other than the ones now that I've reworked and rewired, came from my family of origin. Mm. And um, and my immediate family of origin, you know, my mum, my dad and my brother, where did they get their families? Where did they get their beliefs from? Well, they got their beliefs from their families of origin. And uh, my father had certain life experiences. He was a prisoner of war in uh, Korea. You know, he had certain life experiences which really shaped his belief in the world. His parents divorced when he was very young, which in his generation from a middle upper class British family, it was really rare. So he felt very ashamed of divorce. And so I picked up lots of my beliefs around love. And uh, from that, my mother, um, similarly, she carried her own intergenerational trauma, which she kind of brought into our family. None of it overt in, in our family, it was not overt. You know, I don't have a story of an angry, violent dad or, an, you know, a, a neglectful mother who is me. I, you know, I don't have any extremities, which is, I think, also quite interesting because you kind of go, well, I had a nice family. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can see there were some things that, you know, but they were nice. So it's quite it's quite hard. But what, so I'm, I think what I became really interested in was kind of thinking about, so what's the what instead of thinking about do I need this kind of big trauma to explain why I feel unlovable, which I haven't got. So how do I explain that? Mm -hmm. And then I look at how does my family love? How does my family show love, convey love, mm -hmm. withhold love? Um or yeah. So I think that started to that started to get me thinking about the kind of intergenerational legacy. And when I had boy, when I had, I've got two boys, when I had children, you know, just wanting to not just mindlessly hand it on again. Mm. Mm. So I think I kind of, um, I did, when I did my core training, we did 
we were I, system, I was systemically trained, partly systemically trained. And we did a lot of work around genograms. And I think that was my moment was doing my genogram and seeing where my stuff came from and thinking, oh, so it's, it's, it's mine, but it's not me. It's my inheritance. It's what I've inherited, which means I could choose to disinherit it if I, you know, I don't. If I don't want it or it's not useful, I could choose not to pass it on. So I think I think that kind of uh, was probably my key moment was was doing the genogram. Mm. Mm. And and that's interesting. So it's not this painting, but as I was painting another one which has a tree, um, like I was at one point, I cut out the roots um but then like I've put them back in into the painting and that made me realize that I can um choose I can prune those roots I can choose which things are now of service to me and I can choose what's not necessary anymore and the interesting thing I I found was as well that um, there is a sentence which I've in some lecture I've heard is knowledge is the story that survived. Um, but we somehow take things as arrayified facts <laughs> um, rather than stories. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's where for me the biggest change came when when then you start to wonder, oh, the, the, this is what I'm given, but do I now want to now use it, believe in it? Or I can somewhat change it. But some things are so implicitly present that it's very hard to get to them. <laughs> yeah, and I think that thing, I like that. I'm, I'm going to try and remember that, that that, that knowledge is, uh, what did you say? Well, knowledge knowledge is, is a story that survived. Survives. I really like that because I think that, that I've often used this idea of beliefs, you know, what beliefs to do inherit, because I think beliefs are things we believe. So we think of them as knowledge. But often when we stand back from beliefs, we kind of go, yeah where did that belief come from does everybody believe it therefore if everybody doesn't believe it can't be true therefore why do I believe it and and really starting to question the story we tell there's a systemic idea stories told become stories lived and this idea that we live the story that we're telling ourselves so if we want to live differently we have to change the story that we're telling ourselves um and I think I like I like that phrase I think that's I think that's really right we think things are true when we're young when we're growing up because we're told them and we believe yeah yeah and uh connected to what you said about kind of not uh feeling like well it was okay for me I'm not sure but there was a lot of implicit and and not untold stories basically um I wonder how you connect to that or maybe I'm connecting it but I wonder do you to power and privilege and how how maybe having some privileges stops you to look at your own pain um so i wonder that this is my connection but um maybe maybe you make a different one but maybe just what is power and privilege for you and how the, how did they flow through your life well i mean I, I i could talk for hours on that but i think in my story um i think privilege um it can invalidate your opportunity to understand yourself. So if you, I mean, I'll talk about my story. It's very different for different people, but my story is to come from a family where, because my father is in the army in the UK, I don't know if it's still the case, your children can be sent to boarding school to give them some sort of stability. And I didn't have that because I'm a girl, but my brother did because they wanted him to have a good education. So already they've got a, a difference of kind of um, it's much more important for boys in my in my family story to have a good education than girls. But what I then did was age 12, I did go to boarding school and that was sold to me as something incredibly privileged. I was very lucky and I was incredibly miserable. I made really good friends, um, but I was really miserable and um, and in the end, um, you know, didn't didn't stay. But uh, but I think it's very confusing to be told something that you're very lucky to have this when you're not feeling lucky about it at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
is the kind of I mean, I think that shows up in multiple, multiple ways where we we are privileged to have something that doesn't feel good for us, but we're told we're lucky and it's not actually helpful. Mm. Um, and I would imagine that there are variants on that in multiple yeah. different ways. Yeah, and it's almost like it. if you're so young, it teaches you a way to gaslight yourself that then somehow is um, perpetuated into rest of the situations and then yeah. chances of you fully choosing something off for your own benefit or com- which is kind of congruent with your own needs mm. are lower with more of these experiences um and so for me it was it took basically about 25 years to acknowledge yes i was lucky in some instances and in, and actually I didn't allow myself to feel some other things and I should maybe have felt them. And that led me into some really hard things that I shouldn't have accepted. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I really like what you said around that. And how does, how does that now change now that you have that agency that, you know, you can choose and how does that now change your view of power and privilege maybe? Um, sorry I'm stuck in a thought race to, 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 to what you just said so I'm now doing that job you just uh, if well, I you get, get, respond respond I'll, I'll get back that thought out and then it'll yeah. clear my ability yeah. to respond I think one of the things just listening to you and I was linking that to the, my experiences I think one of the things of lucky not lucky privileged is I think we often go into quite binary thinkings. Either we're privileged or we're not. Either this is good for us or it's bad for us. I think we're often, I think, certainly if I think about my upbringing, there wasn't a lot of nuance. And I would say that there are many, many things about having been sent to boarding school at the age of 12 that I am hugely grateful for having in my life about how I've shaped my thinking. I am hugely grateful. Did that mean I loved every minute of it? No. Would I have liked to have got out of there? Yes. Um, Was it privileged? Yes. Did it help me to grow? Have I got things for which I'm thankful? Yes. Do, would I do it again? Yes you know yeah so I think there's something I think it's I I think it's these things are so I often get kind of a little bit nervous around conversations of power and privilege Mm -hmm. um because I think there are narratives and agendas around them that can get in the way of being able to be more curious and I guess that's where I come back to the curiosity of yeah it was it was very privileged it wasn't all great And I would like the right to be able to complain about the bits that hurt me and acknowledge those whilst at the same time recognising the value of what I got. And I think that ability to be able to hold both, sometimes it is so, so nuanced. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I... Yeah, and I think even as women, you know, in a patriarchal world you kind of go well um you know there are lots of drawbacks and lots of but would I give up being a woman just because that no you know so 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 I think we have to hold it in more like like we have to be more nuanced and uh, and I've I I feel more strongly about that now probably than I did because I think we're moving into a world where nuance is becoming less part of the way we think about things yeah yeah I can I can relate to that and I I think um it's uh, there is a moment where you as you said in the beginning where you become grateful for the things that shaped you but that takes work as well as in like would I repeat this maybe not but can I learn something from from that? Can I choose to to take something from that experience and continue? That's where I think our agency lies. I think that's right. I think what you do with it once you know about it. Yeah. And 
for sure that doesn't happen for most of us until we are at fully out of it. Yes. Until we're fully away from it. I don't think you, um, maybe I'm wrong, I might think differently about this later, but I think it's very hard to tell a different story, live a different story while you're still in it, yes. unless you have really good help or something changes in the story. Um you know, my hating boarding school was my way of going, you can't control me. I'm going to, I'm going to hate this, you know, and I'm going to dig in and I'm going to make you all suffer, mum, dad, for sending me, you know. But actually there were bits of it that I'm hugely grateful for, but I think you changed the story of, of it. Um, and I think that's why m many, many, many people come into therapy quite later, quite a lot later, because it's only as you get out of that yes. story um, or your, the story's still running, but you're no longer in the story yeah that you can start to kind of reevaluate and have that agency yeah, yeah and that's interesting because in in my training we talk about risk for therapy but also risk of therapy because sometimes getting to know the re well what i call the truth or reality mm -hmm. as you're in the midst of it mm -hmm. might pose a lot of risk actually yeah really and yeah. Uh, and in a way that's why things haunt us year after because then the risk is smaller and then we can make meaning much much better and our bodies are in more capacity somehow to to actually do that so yeah and uh i'm wondering so speaking about how yeah power and privilege shape you we spoke a little bit about how gender and and being a woman has shaped you and how how is now how what's your experience of age and and like how are you positioning yourself on that scale <laughs> or on... I love being the age I am I, I'm, I'm slightly uh sort of healthily dreading you know not having my energy and hoping that I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that I hold on to that you know my health I, I just think it's such a gift health it, it, you know really I I I'm very grateful for it and I look after it. Um, I love the age that I am now and I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised. I didn't overly love my 50s, weirdly, because I found that quite a big trans transition. It's quite unsexy 50. Isn't it? It's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> I find it a bit kind of like, I'm not 40, I'm not young, I'm not, you know. So I think it was a very transition year for me, a decade for me. Whereas I I really love this. I feel so much pressure has lifted off me. Nobody's looking at me in a particular way. So I think in terms of power, like I can do pretty much whatever I want. People kind of go, oh, you know, I I can I can do pretty much whatever I want. I I feel like I've um I don't feel I am in power struggles anymore. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm quite happy to back up if somebody feels strongly about something. I'm not going to go head to head. Um, I, I really love. I think. I mean, I, to be fair, I've loved every. I didn't. I didn't overly love turning fifty. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, I think I've loved every decade. In mm -hmm. I think I just. Kind of, I'm very. I think one of my. Um, you know, coming back to sort of ways that you would describe, I'm very embracing of what is. You know, I live very much in the serenity prayer. Not that I'm in recovery from addiction, but I live in, in recovery from unhelpful relational learning. And one of the things that I think has really helped me is the process of accepting what is mm. Mm. and not fighting it. So um, I'll do a bit to look after my health and my looks and my I like feeling, but I'm not going to spend more. It, I'm not going to do that at the expense of something that gives me more joy, which oh. is spending time with people I love and doing my work and things that I really enjoy. So I think it's a really, um, I'd say in the last, yeah, I, I mean, I've, yeah, really, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. If you'd ask my 20 year old self or my 30 year old self, how I'd feel about being 60, I would have looked at 60 year old people and thought, Oh God. But actually being here, I, I feel very excited about being here. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I've got lots more that I would want to do, but if I went tomorrow, I've done I've done enough. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah. What I'm what I'm also sitting with is the way you said um, 
with the ease with which you said a decade <laughs> and you know like <laughs> being, in, being in my 30s I'm sitting with like a year is already like yeah loads of time you know and it's like like and and this idea that like things need to happen now and like that there is no time and um but then and I remember when I was starting doing science and I was doing projects of two three months uh, and I would thought like oh my god you, you kind of like do a lot in three months and and you kind of want to do everything but then now there are some pr experiments that like one experiments last three months so mm. it's like you just get a completely different window of tolerance mm. <laughs> um which I I was like when you said a decade for me that was like whoa so it was a very interesting uh, contrast I think that's really interesting. I think that partly maybe that comes from, and I, I haven't really thought about this before, but I guess maybe it um, comes from when you're um, Eric Erickson, who t talks about life stages, talks about this stage of generativity. And I I was laughing with a friend saying, I think I've hit that a bit early, like I've, I've, I've in a nice way, like I've kind of, um, uh, but I really, I really feel like I'm in that phase of generativity. Mm -hmm. And I think what that is about is about looking back and about giving back and about being in a, you know, if you're looking at Maslow's hierarchy, you know, it's self-actualization, it's that ability to kind of um, uh, contribute in a way that perhaps you can't when you're just trying to sort of scrabble your way into survival. Um, and so I think when you look back, maybe you look back a little bit more in seasons mm -hmm. and and I think decades at easy seasons to kind of think my 20s my 30s my 40s I mean we do that anyway don't we the 90s the 80s the 70s you know we do it we tend to think in I wonder if that is something that you only do looking back because we don't tend to look forward and think well I wonder what will happen in the 2050s we look back and talk about the 60s because we've got a story about that time yeah. and the seasons about that time and that becomes part of your story so I think I think maybe that's where that comes from whereas if you haven't lived those decades yet then they're kind of a bit that's a bit of a weird way to think yeah like it doesn't, yeah. It's, not, it's not resonant you can look back in decades to the life before you you know the 30s the 40s the 50s whatever but not in your I think that's really interesting I hadn't really thought about that but I think it's a reflexive thing it's a thing of looking back yeah I mean, there is a I one of the books I love. Um, it's called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And the end of the book is saying uh, life can be only understood backwards, but lived forwards. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it makes sense to to, to parse out um, more in, in those big chunks rather than what's going to be tomorrow or what can I do in in an hour from now and things like that. And think, um, sorry, do you want to say something? No, no, I think that's right. I think it's very wise. Mm. It can only be um, lived forward and understood backwards, retrospect. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm also wondering. Um, uh, you you speak of giving back, uh, but I think one part we might have missed is what was the transition uh, between the marketing um, and and psychotherapy and how did that switch happen and who are the people who maybe have given to you so that you can give back mm. um I mean some of it was circumstantial so I ran my own business I was very successful at doing that I was busy um and I found myself as a single parent when my children were quite young through my own choice although I didn't choose to end up in that place but I chose to leave my marriage and I just remember it was in the um kind of early 2000s and I the world was becoming from a business perspective a much more global place and I had a sort of seminal moment where I was flying back from a business meeting which I'd been sort of excited about because it was kind of my I was just starting to kind of do much more international work because stuff was becoming much more international and global and it sort of felt exciting and quite a big contrast to kind of nappies and vomit and you know all of that and um but I was uh I was flying back and I had done a dog leg fight and I was 
changing planes in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. And my onward flight got cancelled because of snow. So I stuck in Schiphol Airport and my kids were at home with a babysitter. And I was a single parent. Mm. And I just thought, this isn't how I want to live. I don't want to be stuck. I don't want a babysitter explaining why mum is not coming home. Mm. That just don't want that. Not just for them. I didn't want it. I didn't want to be sat in Schiphol Airport thinking that my babysitter was putting my kids to bed, not me. And um, so there was a really, and I had a lot of time to sit there <laughs> waiting for the flight. And I just thought, this is not going to work. I, I just, this isn't going to work. I can't, I don't want to do this. What on earth can I do? And part of my um, story is that I hated boarding school so much that I climbed out of a window and ran away. <laughs> and so I don't have any, I didn't get any A-levels. I didn't go to university. And that didn't stop me doing well in my career but I thought well maybe now's the time maybe I could just do some studying maybe I just take some time I'd earned enough money to feel like I could survive for a bit it wasn't super easy but I I had some savings and I thought oh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna do that so sat in Schiphol airport it'd go almost to like a wind up internet cafe it went like we didn't you know and I kind of and I started googling the open university and I thought oh you don't need anything I can just sign up and literally signed up just took us just crazy just impulsive oh. no front brain prefrontal cortex just whoosh decision just signed up but it was one of those impulsive decisions that was just I've never looked back and thought that was wrong um mm. and uh so then everything changed very quickly I wound my business down I didn't I didn't even want to go through the process of selling it so I didn't make lots of money by selling it I just thought I just I'm done now I'm on to the next thing I don't I want that left and I and I had a lovely three years I did my open university degree undergraduate psychology degree in three years I had a really lovely time I really enjoyed studying learning couldn't understand why I'd hated it so much at school I just you know that curiosity in me just was like oh my goodness this is what studying and learning is like um I just was voracious I just gobbled everything read every everything um and was able to completely do I love the open university I mean I just thank goodness for it I mean just what a what a gift because I could do it whenever I had time around my kids um they were not impacted at all um and and that was really, that was the shift. Why did I choose psychology is really because I'd always been on the receiving end of listening to people. And I thought it would be really interesting to go deeper into understanding people. So I think to start with, it was more kind of going, I wonder if I'd be a better market researcher if I understood people even better. Mm. Um, I think I probably thought I might go into something like occupational psychology rather than psychotherapy because I had a business background. But just I was interested. I got little kids. I'm interested to understand little humans. Mm. Um, and who isn't interested in psychology? I mean, it's just a fascinating subject. I'd read lots of really, I, I'd read uh, two of the books that had really, really, really impacted me. It was by a girl called, a woman called Kate Red, uh, Redfield Jameson, who had a breakdown whilst being a psychiatrist. And she writes her story. And I just remember thinking, wow, that's really cool. Like you can be high functioning in the field not recognizing that you're having the thing that you're treating other people for and you know just like how does that happen um and Viktor Frankl's book Man's Search for Meaning and mm -hmm. those two books had really um made me interested in the mind mm -hmm. and the power of the mind so that was my kind of change and then it was very incremental then I just then I kind of finished that and the kids were still little and I didn't, you know, so I then did a master's and I did my, my master's was in relationship therapy. Oh, OK. Um, so I spent three years doing that. I started working and seeing clients during that um, and realised that my strength, my orientation was relational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do I relate to myself? How do I relate to you? How do I, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that still is my work and everything bolts into that. Um, and then about I then worked and did a, and then I did a doctorate about. I started in 20, I can't remember, 17, I think, um, more out of boredom and wanting stimulation. I like learning. 
you know, I didn't do it because I thought it would necessarily take me anywhere, but just because I quite like that structured format for learning and being made to read things outside of what I would have thought I was going to read. You mm. know, but for me, I really loved it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's how I did it. And I'm sitting also around curiosity being a businesswoman. Uh, what does that mean? And the uh, entrepreneurial spirit. And so I'm, I'm, I'm quite sitting with um, being trained in psychotherapy, but not necessarily being trained in business. And what does that mean? Uh, and so I'm curious, what are your insight on that side? Mm. So I trained in the other way around. I trained in business. Yeah. 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 But I trained in business. No, I never went and did an MBA or I mean, I, I didn't do I didn't do any. I, I remember doing a, a market research study diploma, which was kind of but I didn't I didn't ever train in business. And actually, interestingly, one person was very, very formative for me in my business career. So when I, I used to work as a, I mean, I started out as a secretary. I didn't start out running my business, I started out as a secretary. And I really metaphorically, we were in a five story building in London and the secretaries and the admin team were in the basement and the directors were at the top. And you literally kind of worked your way up the floors. And and I. I learned by watching and asking and being precocious and and just pushing my way up the floors I just thought I don't really want to sit here in the basement it's all right but that looks more interesting how do you get there I think I was quite lucky because the the, the company that I work for is very small and there were there then their execs who were on this floor three uh they were all Cambridge and Oxford grad you know, graduates they were all really well so I kind of I kind of thought well oh, I don't have that um, so I kind of I just worked out what the qualities were mm -hmm. that the people on the fourth and fifth floor had. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's always been about how do I need to be? Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm very efficient. I strive mm -hmm. for excellence. If you give me something to do, I'll do it. And I'll probably do it better than you thought or asked for it consciously. Like I'll go that mm -hmm. extra mile. Um, and so my business was based on quite intuitive skills for being in the world that weren't necessarily business orientated, mm -hmm. but they are entrepreneurial skills. I didn't know that at the time, but they're the skills that I think are, I think they're essential. If you want to be entrepreneurial, you need to be innovative and dynamic and, work hard and curious and learning all the time and yeah all of that so I just learned it along the way so for you you're doing it aren't you you're <laughs> doing the podcast you're making connections you know you got in touch with me you're making opportunities happen you're taking them and I, I, so I think you've got those things I think this idea of business yeah. I, don't know, I find this idea of business the kind of I mean I'm sure it's relevant and if we all were to go and run a FTSE 100 company I'm, I'd be a bit rubbish but you know I think the idea of kind of entrepreneurial I think is slightly different yeah but it's interesting um um being I uh, sorry I need to backtrack to see what I want to say but I think it's something along the lines of how many of things that we put names to are actually just emergent properties of being human so, you know, being a therapist or being a scientist or being entrepreneurial, uh, it's almost like if you're not part of that profession, it's almost forbidden to you to find those parts of yourself inside yourself. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they emerged, they emerge as professions because they are parts of us as humans. Yeah. Therefore, every human can potentially find them somewhat in themselves mm -hmm. and not maybe name them artists or a therapist or and so that's why I think for me the being human and doing psychotherapy is is part of of the title because it's the psychotherapy stems from the nature of being human somehow and as well the entrepreneur or the businesswoman lady or so and, and I can that's why I can now relate to what you're saying as yes I am already there but then there is that thing what we said being enough being enough but I think the thing that's really because I wonder I don't know if you if if I think there's a combination given that most psychotherapists are women mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a kind of interesting mix that psycho 
psychotherapists, I think there's something about those soft skills that often feel a bit conflictual with the idea of being business orientated. Mm. So I can remember when I did my training, um, I did my my training, uh, my relationship training, I did with Relate, who are a big relationship charity in the UK. And uh, and I worked in all sorts of different late offices in Peterborough and Cambridge and, and, and Norfolk. And in Cambridge, when I got there, they did something slightly different. And we as therapists were asked to negotiate the fee with the client. They had a sort of sliding scale and you had to say, you know, can I ask your income? And then this is a sliding scale. This is what we'd ask you to pay. Is that OK? And I just took the piece of paper and, yeah, that's fine. Kind of went in and did that. And, and I came out and 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 uh, there was a, about three or four psychotherapists in the thing. And they said, how did you get on with asking about the fees? It's really hard. I thought, God, it didn't even occur to me that was hard. That's just negotiating. Mm-hmm. It's the skill of negotiating. And I think what, what other fields give us is they allow properties to emerge that we're all capable of. We really are. But I think that psychotherapy somehow almost can kind of look not that it's a dirty word but it's almost like kind of oh, I, I wouldn't want to do that whereas actually I think it's a really important skill because you know if we can't negotiate with our clients if we can't put boundaries in place with our clients if we um then we can't help them to also be able to do that and so I think these you're right these skills are properties that are human the ability to negotiate, the ability to hold a boundary, the ability to be kind, the ability to say no, the ability to uh, have compassion, all of these skills are um, to be creative, to to be hardworking, whatever it is, to learn, to grow, to change our minds, to listen. They're all human qualities. Mm. But I think sometimes we have a narrow, my observation is we have a narrow view of which qualities are appropriate yes, as a psychotherapist really. and which ones aren't. And I know mm. that one of the reasons that my practice has grown as fast as it has, where I charge the fees that I do and I get repeat business and I don't advertise anywhere. This is the first thing I've ever done. I've never done a podcast for nothing is because I focus on those entrepreneurial skills of excellence, curiosity, creativity, negotiating boundaries, kindness, compassion, results orientated. Those are all my business qualities. They mm-hmm. emerge in that, but you're right, they're human. Yeah. They're not, I haven't had to go to school to learn them. They just... Yeah. Now I'm sitting with curiosity. How did you start that? That like that, what was, Who was your first client? And then how did you build up from that? Uh, yeah. as, I'm, I'm, so I was with Relate. My first client were a couple. And I just remember the first thought I had, was, oh, gosh, I wish they'd given you to somebody else. You'd do so much better with somebody else than with me. I remember just immediately that self-doubt, you know, your first ever client. Um, I mean, I just relate with great. I mean, what a great training place. You see individuals, you see people going through trauma of divorce and separation and marital breakdown. And you've got all of the trauma stuff of attachment trauma playing out and dynamics and behavioral stuff about how do we talk to each other. I mean, I just learned so, so much. Um, uh, It was a brilliant, brilliant place to learn. I was was so lucky to have a brilliant, several brilliant supervisors um, and I, I think one of my, one of my great, uh, um, is it a strength? I don't know what you call it, but one of the, one of my qualities that I really value is I don't get embarrassed very easily. Mm. And, and, and that's been learned. It's not innate. I've learned not to get embarrassed. So if I don't know something, I just ask. And I really don't care. If somebody goes, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you don't know that. I kind of go, yeah, no, it's really weird. I don't know. I'm so sorry. I probably should. Can you just help me? So that's the curious. It's like, if I don't know it, I'm not going to dwell in the anxiety of looking a fool. Yeah. I'd rather look a fool and get that information because then we're done. Now I've got it. Now I can move on to the next thing. So I'm very, and I know I've learned that. I can remember you know, being young, really young, you know, 19, 20, the agony of thinking, I don't know the answer to that. There's this, even in a meeting, somebody be talking about some acronym, you know, you know, the BPRG, and you go, oh, 
Yeah. And I just very quickly went, sorry, I probably should know this. I don't. What's the BPRG? Somebody please tell me. And realising that every, half the room would go, oh, thank goodness she asked. Yeah. And I just went, well, that wasn't hard. Yeah. Like nobody in my life has ever turned around and said, well, that's your get out. How dare you not know that? Yeah. You know, somebody sometimes people have said, Oh, I'm quite surprised you don't know that. I've thought, but I kind of go, Yeah, I know. Well, I yeah, I'm quite surprised I don't know that. How did I miss out knowing that? I don't know. So I think not getting embarrassed is one of the things that I really but I've learned, I've worked really hard for that to to not get embarrassed. It's not an innate thing. I think hum, embarrassment is a human yeah. thing, shame, not wanting to look a fool. But I've worked so hard to go, I'm not gonna let that be the story of my life. Mm. So, mm. I think that helps with the business and then linking in to to you know those first clients when you sit there and you think oh, I don't know what I'm doing mm. and I literally I remember writing process reports when I was training and thinking why did I ask that question I don't know I just asked it and making up some rubbish about why I'd asked it I just no idea no idea how could somebody think Oh, what I'll do next is I'll ask this question because that will help me go there. Now I do that intuitively and instinctively, you know, but I didn't at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can I can relate. I I sit with a lot of, I personally am quite intuitive and I love to just, um, yeah, feel my way through. Um but then uh, I do get a little bit taken aback with that reflective process, which I think it's important to build up that inner inner supervisor, inner therapist and all the inner layers. And sometimes it also feels like it can stifle the work. It can stifle you in the process of what if that person is not the caring supervisor <laughs> or the caring therapist, then it can be like, what are you doing now? Why are you doing this now? Mm. Whereas it, like but it can be like Alex can you be curious of what has just happened here <laughs> so it's 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 building that yeah. um, that that way of working and and that inner voice that then can yeah but I'm so interesting that you're speaking about embarrassment because that's exactly what I've just discovered about myself recently through some processes and I said and I I my biggest question is like what did I do wrong here and when you're starting from that question in a relationship, mm -hmm. it is basically a hook for disaster. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to, oh, what went wrong there? Yes. Yeah. So you yeah. so so the key is something has gone wrong, potentially. Yeah. But yeah. not what did I do wrong? It, it might be you did something unhelpful. Yeah. It might be. Yeah. And I think we need space for that because otherwise we can't grow. But thinking about what went wrong. Yeah. And I think that being able to go into that space rather than being defensive about that, you know, and I think that one, I mean, one again comes back to my, my upbringing. One of the things I'm so grateful for is not having this stellar education that my brother had where you kind of set up to be perfect and you, it's all going to go really well because mm -hmm. I had to kind of just scrabble about kind of learning stuff. And so nobody was expecting anything of me yeah and therefore you, know, you don't expect and from therefore your it's never a surprise when I don't know anything and I think that's been really helpful to me um by the time my friends finished university and I had run away from school at the end of the second term of my A-levels I had had just over four years of working so I was in a I was just way way ahead mm. in that kind of sense and um and developing sort of skills I, I you know I I just value so much so again it comes back to adversity and how yeah. you know yeah and that's an interesting thing about like learning from doing and how much um school sometimes is learning uh, it's it's not uh, informed by the doing and often quite outdated it's not not really in the here and now and so I've noticed for myself um when I was studying biochemistry the thing I mean I'm really grateful from going for going through that process because I can see how the depth by which I can understand the here and now 
but then I can also see how that stifled me in a way to be like, what's the current thing? What's the best thing now? What's the most efficient? Rather than going like, this is what has been done and this is the standard of whatever. So so I can see how having universities almost also brings you up with this kind of idea of I deserve something because... Yes. And and it's it's stifling because uh, it also puts you in a quite an ego based driven state where you are doing things because you know it feels like well I'm deserving of this because I've gone through this like whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I I see you know my kids are twenty four and twenty five. I, I see that if you say to a child work hard, work hard, work hard, you need results, it'll it'll help your life. Work hard, work hard, you need results, and it'll help your life. And you're the kid and you believe your parents. So you do that and you work hard and you get good results and you work hard and you get really good results. And then you suddenly pop out in the world age 22 or 23. And you're with all the other people who worked hard and got good results. And it's a bun fight and it's really hard. And what you haven't been given, or in many cases haven't been given, is the other qualities that you're going to need to, to move forward. And, and the... I mean, it, it, I despair sometimes, that's a strong word, but I despair at our, I don't know if it's, what I don't know what it's like in other countries, but our, our UK perspective on education, mm. it's not learning frigging facts. Mm. It really isn't learning facts. Of course, you need to learn facts. You need to learn processes. You need to learn how to read, to write, to express yourself, to argue, to, um, to uh, question, to memorize. You need to learn processes. You mm. need to learn processes. And we focus on l learning facts, facts. Yeah. And, and showing those facts in a particular way that somebody else prescribes. Don't be creative, don't question the process, just do that. We stifle so much of the qualities that you know, I'm so grateful for that actually I didn't have in my education. My education was so, so shocking that I developed those other qualities because I didn't have all the other things, you know. And when uh, you say qualities, can you name some of them? Um, finding out. Yeah. You know, finding out, going, uh, um, pushing through doors, kind of working out how things work. Well, well, well how does it work then? How, do you, how did you get your job here then? What did you do? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I haven't done that. How did you get your job here? I mean, just being you know, kind of thinking about rather than thinking, but I've got my A levels. Yeah. And I see that I've got two boys and I have huge compassion for them because they've done nothing wrong. They've done what the system told them to do. Yeah. They've done what the system told them to do. Yeah. Yeah, I can, um, I can, I can very much relate. Yeah, I can. Very and of much course, it's it's not fair to. It's not fair as a society, and particularly my generation, it's not fair to say, do this, do this, do this. It's really important that you do this. It's really, oh, I'm so proud of you. Oh, you've got four A stars. That's incredible. You're so amazing. Wow, wow. You're just so proud of you. Facebook, God, my, you know, Stella, lovely little, amazing little Bob, Bobby's got four A stars. So proud of you. You know, kiss, kiss, love, love. All that performative self esteem. It's not fair to then turn around and go, what is wrong with this generation? They're so full of anxiety. They're snowflakes. They can't do it. And what did you expect? What did we expect? What does anybody expect? If you if you set people up to believe that the world works on that way, mm. of course the natural byproduct of going out in the world and finding it doesn't work like that is anxiety. Yeah. And then... You heap more anxiety on those people. Then what's wrong with you for being so anxious? What's wrong with your generation? Why are you all so snowflakey? Why are you on Instagram all the time? What's wrong? With... Mm. I mean, it's like it's yeah. I mean, I, that's my little rant. But it, you know, we have but, to take yeah. some sense of responsibility. M my generation, perhaps as a backlash against having, I don't know, I don't know why did my generation. Because it is my generation, the ones who've all educated their kids, kind of focused on results and set up the education system to be so focused on results and league tables. And all. Why? I don't know. I'm sure yeah. somebody will have good I ideas. Mean, I, I imagine that it's practical, but uh, 
but I, I, I am sitting with, with quite a similar thing. I, I am from Serbia and, and I, I always thought like if I have gone through this system, I would probably fail miserably. Um, and, but even, even there, because my parents kind of had that belief that, you know, you just work hard and you do your best and that's enough. But then, you, then you do come into the real world and you realize these are like, I'm almost like I have no skills. Like there are some, and, and then it's like, almost like, you don't know if you want to feel angry or want to kind of be curious and start learning, but then it's like a mix of all of those things at the same time. Um, and, and, and then you kind of, at one point you do take, or I did feel like I took agency for, but it, it was first to like work through all that grave disappointment of like a whole worldview kind of crumbling down. Um, and like having, and, and especially we've talked about self gaslighting It's about like being very acutely attuned to your own intuition which is exactly the opposite of what, you know, you're taught through that system, which is to basically fill in the tasks without without being curious even what's happening for you inside. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I can relate to what you're saying because then you enter the world where it's the intuition that makes a difference. It's you knowing what you want, what you need to create for yourself. But then everyone was teaching you, and even I think you've said that, what do I need to be to get there? Whereas we don't even ask the questions, what do I want to be? And how do I get there? <laughs> mm. And yeah. for me, it was, it, and I still am like, I'm still sitting with this question. I'm not even sure what, like now that like I can remove all of this, what do I want to be? What mm. are like, <laughs> now mm. that I have this, like, like all the letters, all the, what do I really want to be? And it's it's that that no one really asked you in this whole process. Yeah. And I think um a question that I often um think about with that is how do you want to live? Yeah. Because I think the question of how do you want to live helps you work out who do you want to be. And I and I think there's I think it, I don't know whether but I think lots of people can feel quite oppressed by that who am I question. I, I mean I think that does that is something that gets much easier as you get older as you work out who you are and who you're becoming. You know I love Michelle Obama's book about becoming. You oh, know, I love it. Yeah. You know it's something about we are we can't be it when we're becoming it. We have to kind of. But I think having a guiding light that is how do I want to live and I you know we were talking earlier about age one and and looking back and looking forwards one of my one of my favorite therapeutic tools is that I almost always almost always um ask my clients to build a relationship with their 80 year old self and to make a connection with him her mm. and they and to be able to use that person to guide them where they are now. How did you get there? What wisdom have mm. they got? Because actually what that does is it accesses the wisdom in our spiritual selves mm. that we have now anyway. But I think we do need guiding lights to need to know where we're going to go. Um, mm. where do we? How do we want to live? Who do we want to become? Mm. We don't have to be it now, but who do we want to become? And what what's the journey to becoming that? And what are the qualities around that? Um, and I think if we haven't had, you know, if we haven't had good parents and good role models, and if we've had trauma, and we've had, I think it can be very, um, you know, part of recovery from that is involving finding those inner resources to help guide. Yeah, yeah, and also, I mean, I at least my parents growing up in war and inflation, you don't get to ask those questions. Mm. So I can see how me not being as that question is very reflective of what they were going through yeah. in their own process so yeah. but it's important to when you can get to a point to ask that for of yourself be able to know what what are you even asking and how do I want to live I think it's a really good mm -hmm. starting point so just kind of to wrap up I just want to ask you is there anything that you feel like I haven't asked but you feel like a burning desire to share um, no, I don't. 
I don't think so. I don't think so. I think um no. Hmm. And then the the rapid fire questions which you alluded to. So what kind of compliments do you like to receive? <laughs> and how can can you receive them now? <laughs> I like receiving any compliments that are authentic. Mm. If they're authentic from that person, even if they dirt, you know, even if I find them hard. If I, I can, somehow I think you can tell if somebody if if they genuinely believe that mm -hmm. about me or my experience of me or whatever, uh, I love those. If somebody is giving me a compliment somehow to kind of I don't know for their gain rather than for mine, then I'm not so keen on those. They mm -hmm. I don't tend to receive those. I tend to just kind of go thanks for that. Mm -hmm. so I think any compliment that is authentic from the giver, uh, I'm open to and grateful for. Mm -hmm. and is there an absurd thing about you that not many people know about or wouldn't connect to you mm. well I probably told you that already which is most people are quite surprised when they know that I've got no education and that I quite run away from school um I mean yeah uh, absurd well I would say that probably the most absurd thing about me is that um uh, in my rebellious having run away from school phase I was very punky I was a punk rocker and I played in a music band and uh, I did a music promotion video with a band who are now huge called the Pesh Mode and hung out with lots of sort of music people and kind of and I don't have anything to do with that now but so it feels quite absurd to the life that I live now Mm, mm. that's that is why i love this question it really brings out the parts and of us and idiosyncrasies that um reminds us how rich we are and how much we sometimes choose to kind of put somewhere in the background yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh and uh, the last one is like what do you what, what do you like to give to others um i love sharing knowledge in my time mm. I love I just love I love peer supervision I love peer training I love um I, I mean I'm inherently and again innate or not I, I'm inherently generous and I'm I love helping and I will help wherever I can and that sounds a bit kind of mm -mm, sort of squeaky clean but I mean I really just love I love you know I do it for me I love the process of I learn through teaching you know I learn through rehearsing and speaking things out loud and sharing with people so I just love my community of psychotherapist friends and people that I work with and know and I I am I, I love giving I'm a proper SWOT. I mean, I read massive study loads. I, I, and I love sharing that. Hmm. Hmm. So that and I, I realized yeah. I didn't even ask you anything about psychotherapy, but I feel it was all present. <laughs> um, no, no. Yeah. But I told you my story, so you kind of got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just really want to thank you. And it was really wonderful to witness your curiosity uh, and, and energy. I think that's uh, what stayed with me is that presence and energy and, and curiosity. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with me. And Well, Alexandra, thank you so much for reaching out to me because that's that entrepreneurial, connective, relational thing. And I really, I honestly, when you, when you, when I got your email, and I thought, oh, nobody's ever asked me to do a podcast before. That's really cool. How nice is that? I had a little warm feeling uh, inside me that made me feel really good. And um, and and I really love that kind of connective part in you, the entrepreneurial part mm -hmm. in you. And mm -hmm. um, and just would you know love to to kind of compliment you on that because we wouldn't be doing this without you. And I don't know, you know, where that goes for you, but I feel really encouraged and excited by that. I can kind of see, mm. I can see an 80 year old version of you who's going to kind of yeah. look back and think, um, yeah, that was kind of a part of my story, part of my journey. Yeah. So, and interestingly, it's, it's a really, the, the curiosity is what I relate to because 
this is where it all started. It's it's all it's the curiosity of human stories and experiences, and I I felt like I couldn't fully ask those questions for me, for me, which is also for me, but I couldn't fully ask them in like conversations, um, uh, in very short like fifteen minutes contact. So I was like, oh, this is I really needed more of this. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it is all about story, the stories we've been told, the stories we live, the stories we retell, and re you know, yeah. what it really is so spot on. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you.